Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar, Redressing the 70% Failure Rate of Digital Transformations. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to uh, begin by thanking you all for taking the time out of your uh, days to join us today. Um, I'm delighted to be hosting this along with two uh, technology innovators, uh, that's Synaptech uh, and Box. Uh, and today we're going to share with you how you can avoid the pitfalls of digital transformation and deliver the future of work. Um, just before we get started, i uh, just like to take a couple of minutes for some introductions. So I'm Adam Turner, Business Development Manager at Sferica. Um, we've been delivering user-centric IT services now for over 10 years or so um, to household names as diverse as Virgin Trains, the West Bromwich Building Society and McColl's Retail. And one of the things I think we do really well at Sverica is get to know our clients' businesses uh, and work as closely with them uh, as we possibly can. And it's really been by taking this approach that helps us recognise that there are often common issues that uh, businesses uh, face. So um, it was the insight really that led us to create a new digital innovation division, which is dedicated to delivering better ways of working through uh, intelligent process automation. So. On that note, I'd like to introduce Carl Nicholson. He's the CIO of Synaptech, uh, the new division that's uh, revolutionising how work is done. Uh, and you'll hear more from Carl uh, shortly. Hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> we're also proud to partner with uh, leading software vendors to deliver the technology that uh, our clients require uh, to deliver the change. So I'd also like to introduce you to Henry Graham Smith uh, from Box, uh, one of our key technology partners. Uh, Box was recently named a leading cloud content platform uh, by Forrester uh, and boasts 70% of the Fortune 500 companies as clients. So absolutely delighted to be joined by Henry today as well. Thank you, Adam. Um, uh, one last uh, point within the webinar tool, you'll hopefully see on the right hand side on the menu bar, you have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, we've, we've allowed some time at the end of the session for these. Uh, and we've also got a couple of polls as we go through the session as well, just to, I guess, get your, your views of, of IT as well as we as we wander through. So um, I thought I'd begin by just stating what joins our three companies together. And that is that we all share a vision for a better, more connected, collaborative ways of working in today's increasingly uh, digital world. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about why digital transformation uh, is so vital before head handing over to uh, Henry and Carl to take you through a couple of demos. Um, so firstly, when thinking about consumers today, uh, they're now more digitally savvy than they ever have been before. And so companies are having to rethink how they do business. Um, for example, it's one thing gathering lots of data on clients, but the real value comes from using that insight so that we can provide a truly personalized customer experience. Uh, and if you just think about the impact that changing consumer habits have had on the retail sector uh, and see how technology has fundamentally changed the high street, uh, quite simply, if companies don't evolve and offer a great customer experience, there's a real risk that the competition will leave them behind. Um, so I've just taken this quote from Gartner. I think it's a really good one. Uh, customer experience is the last source of sustainable differentiation and the new competitive battleground. Uh, secondly, if we think about our employees, they're more empowered and more informed than they ever have been before. Um, if you think back to the IT experience that we had at work, say, 20 years or so ago, it offered actually much more than we had at home, where we were largely reliant on uh, poor equipment, uh, dial-up internet, those good old days. Um, but now, actually, it's gone full circle and the user experience at home is often better than, than it is at work. Uh, there are less restrictions. We can simply download apps onto our devices whenever we choose. Uh, if we don't like an app, we simply delete it and select another one. And our staff have come to expect the same degree of flexibility uh, at work. Um, then there's our relationship with our partners as well. Uh, to scale at pace, businesses are often reliant on their partner relationships uh, for everything from marketing to the supply chain. And it's only really by embedding a more connected, collaborative ways of working that we can really get the best out of these relationships. And then uh, finally, possibly uh, most importantly, um, the security and data protection concerns. With, with IT departments needing to enable access to data outside of the business, that might be for 
staff working from home or on client sites or collaborating with external partners, the importance of securing and maintaining control over data is absolutely essential, um, especially when you consider the, the penalties and the fines that go along uh, with GDPR. So I've just sort of covered off briefly why getting the strategy right is so important. Um, yet why do so many projects not actually reach their goals? Well, there was a piece of research by McKinsey and Co, which found that 70% of businesses actually say their digital transformation won't actually reach its goal. Um, I've actually seen some industry commentators that say that figure might actually be as high uh, as 86 percent um, and when you consider that the investment in digital transformation programs is estimated to reach two trillion us dollars by 2022 uh, there's there's a huge need to improve uh, these success rates so we actually wanted to dig a little bit deeper um, to understand what was behind all this so early this year we actually conducted a piece of research uh, along with box um, where we surveyed around 2,000 employees in SMEs and tried to get to understand about their use and their experience of IT in the workplace. And the results were really interesting. We found that organizations are still investing in technology, but there were four real common failings that we identified. Firstly, there's a real lack of a clear strategy. So this results in tools being adopted without a real clear goal. Um, one of the advantages of cloud technology is the ease in which cloud solutions can be deployed, which is often as simple as uh, providing credit card details. Uh, means that tools just uh, are adopted in isolation just to solve an immediate business need. Um, secondly, there's a real lack of integration between platforms, which means data often sits in multiple systems. They often don't connect to each other. So users end up having to access uh, several different applications just to complete simple everyday tasks. Uh, and that of course wastes time and it also increases the risk uh, of human errors as well. Um, uh, number three on the list there, users aren't engaged in the decision-making process. Uh, and so tools are adopted often without consultation on user requirements. Um, one of the services that we actually run at Sferica are end user workshops where we gather users from our clients' uh, businesses from uh, multiple departments, and we ask them about their IT experience, what is good, uh, what could be improved, um, because after all, these are the very people that are using the systems and the applications all day, every day, so why not go and ask them? Uh, and then finally, data and platform sprawl. This is a huge issue, and I know Carl will come on to this uh, in his presentation, um, but with the adoption of apps being so simple, data is often stored and duplicated across the business. Um, there may also be similar systems already in place, so users end up again having to update different systems with the same data. Um, we actually came across one technology company, who I shan't name, uh, that actually had two instances of uh, Salesforce being used by different sales team uh, within the same building. So, um, so, so we found some real interesting uh, interesting examples out there um just on the on the uh, the point on the right hand side of the slide there we, we took all of the data that we gathered and uh, did a calculation um and it showed that the amount of time being wasted by not being able to quickly access uh and share data w w was huge um it actually was around 5.2 hours per week per employee which was the equivalent of five hundred thousand pounds in wasted time for a, an organization with around 150 employees. So the opportunities to become more efficient are, are absolutely huge. So just finally, to address the, these issues then, uh, our conclusion is that strategies need to be developed with current and future needs in mind, um, and they must have the customer uh, and the employees at the heart to ensure that investment decisions actually deliver real true value for the business. Um, and I've just got a, a quote on here from a professor Klaus Schwab, author of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, who states that uh, we need to shape a future that works for all by putting people first, empowering them, and constantly reminding ourselves that all of these technologies are first and foremost tools made by people uh, for people. So you just see that the first poll has popped up there. So if you all wouldn't mind just uh, having a quick uh, answer of that. Um, and uh, I shall hand over to uh, Henry from Box now to show you how you can address uh, the uh, one of those biggest challenges I've just covered off, which is uh, how to manage data. Uh, Henry. Thank you very much. 
Um, thank you very much, Adam. Um, whatever type of business you're running, you'll be facing those sorts of business challenges that Adam just described. And all of these factors, these trends, mean that you're probably starting to think about a new way of working. And that can be enabled um, by a new approach to IT. Uh, for example, Intuit, an interesting fi fintech company, handles a lot of sensitive information, financial data and tax records, and it has taken a best of breed approach to IT architecture. Screen, screen sharing has stopped. Let me just check. It's gone. Yeah, we're, we're still on poll on my screen. Ah, sorry about that, everybody. Close poll. There we go. There we go. Please share and come back. Sorry about that. Um, yes. Um, the CIO of, of Intuit, who's called Atticus Tyson, has said he wanted to provide a best of breed tool to the workforce. He emphasized that it's important to be on an open platform as the nature of work evolves, the tool set they provide can also evolve, giving um, means that they can meet the needs of the business. This highlights that CIOs and IT leaders are doing what it takes in terms of technologies to enable their workforces to be more productive, drive business agility, and also meet the needs of modern workforce. The modern IT stack, the modern IT stack needs to address a range of business needs from improving productivity through secure logon to signing contracts. Within each area, there are often a number of best of breed specialists that meet the different companies' needs. Uh, but what you're seeing here is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, but you have the productivity suites from Office 365, G Suite and iWork, messaging from Slack, Workplace by Facebook, uh, identity management from Okta, uh, for example, meeting solutions, you might choose Zoom. And then there are lines of business systems like Salesforce, Oracle NetSuite and Workday. The one vendor for all things enterprise, the monolithic approach, no longer works in today's business landscape and IT architecture. There are fundamental differences between the traditional monolithic approach and the new best of breed architecture. Everything in the monolithic world is proprietary. The vendor tools play, but vendor tools play well with each other, but only with each other. And by contrast, the best of breed tools are by definition interoperable and they are designed to play seamlessly together. Monolithic vendors are slow to change. They have massive organizations and are not innovating at the speed of best of breed vendors, which are more nimble and constantly innovating. So customers always have access to the latest and greatest. From a user perspective, monolithic systems are often complex. They're cumbersome to use. They frequently require training and certification to master, while best of breed tools are designed with the user in mind first and foremost, so they are simple and intuitive. Buying from a monolithic vendor essentially locks you in. It becomes very difficult to leave that ecosystem, even when the solution is no longer meeting the company needs. And on the flip side, the best of breed offers the flexibility to choose, making it easier to plug and play, to adapt technology um, to the evolving needs of the business. And lastly, the monolithic vendor focuses on product breadth, trying to do a little bit of everything, sort of jack of all trades, not being great at any one thing, while the best of breed technology focuses on product specialization so that each application represents expertise and specialization in that particular domain. So companies, customers see real benefits from this best of breed approach. However, it is not without its challenge. Work and content can become fragmented across different storage silos. This is the biggest risk after deploying a technology stack where you have so many applications that are being used across the business. This, this fragmented content can become and produce some negative impacts. 
employee productivity can be hindered, for instance, by not using correct versions of the document. Content stored in a number of different locations creates inefficiencies in business processes by increasing the effort required to access desired or necessary information. And users have to browse through numerous systems and documents to find the right content. Increased security risks and liability. As content is spread across a range of different tools, it becomes more difficult to manage all of those tools and understand what content is where, and less visibility drives difficulty around control on that content. This introduces the need for a flexible and interoperable content layer to support the best of breed workplace tools. Solving how to glue these tools together is an architectural challenge for all organizations, large and small. This will be easier if you partner with organizations like Spherica to produce one content layer. This pattern allows you to have one single source of truth uh, for all of your unstructured content. It will be surfaced into the most appropriate tool for all your knowledge workers at the right time in the right way. And it allows you to unlock all of the business value hidden in that unstructured content. Box now has over 90,000 business customers across the, across the globe. These cover all industries and types of use cases. They range from the small mom and pop company uh, with a few users solving simple collaborative requirements in their organization, uh, through to large multinational companies in highly regulated inter industries who use Box for a wide range of complex business challenges. Using Box as a single layer for all of your content, you build on the foundation of security compliance in region storage and content services and end users, both internal and external, can manage content and drive business processes from Box native applications, the web app, mobile application, uh, workflow from Box Relay. And then you get out of the gate integrations with over 1400 SaaS applications, improving knowledge workers productivity and ensuring that no matter where content is flowing across the organization, it is centralized and secure. And many companies work with Box partners such as Ferica to leverage Box APIs to connect this single source of truth with back office and line of business systems and build custom applications to provide tailored experiences for employees, vendors, suppliers, and customers. Just as a taking a deeper look into these sorts of use cases, the solution allows you to power digital transformation across the whole of your enterprise for all of your content processes and security. And these fall primarily into two large buckets of use cases. On the left hand side, you have the digital workplace requirements supporting your organizational goals. These include individual productivity and team collaboration use cases making your teams more efficient, making it easier for IT to manage content, bringing that content under control and reducing the risk that poorly managed content can raise for your company. And the other bucket, the two columns on the right hand side, they uh, focus around the core business and transforming this is uh, transforming this digital business, having your content in one secure platform integrated across your whole enterprise supports both collaborative and intelligent business processes such as marketing campaigns, sales productivity, loan processing, all those sorts of things. And we find that customers get the value, the most value out of Box when it is truly embedded into their critical business processes and use it to transform how they carry out their business both internally and externally. As an example, I'm going to present a short presentation uh, to, um, and this is going to be a know your customer banking financial sector demo. However, I'm presenting it today because it shows some capability with Box that you might not be familiar with and that you might not suspect. 
The first part of the demo uses our Box platform capability, building an application that looks nothing like Box to allow end users to interact with the business to perform a vital core business process. And as you watch this, consider similar use cases that you might have within your business. The demonstration starts with a customer applying for a product, a new product or a service from their bank. Here they use their online banking application, which is integrated with Box Platform. And first, the application requests that the customer uploads an image of themselves. This image can be used with facial recognition to validate the customer passport, the driver's license, and the customer also provides proof of address in the form of a utility bill and proof of earnings as well. And once the documents are uploaded to Box, we use Box skills integrated with AWS text tract and recognition services. And these services provide facial recognition and extraction of text, which will be applied to box metadata. A confidence score is derived and the documents are marked either as valid or invalid. And box skills can integrate with any AI or machine learning solution, bringing the best of breed service to all of the, your content in box. And these could include passport validated, valid, validity checking services and national identity schemes etc and then i'll go and show you a little bit of the box back end before passing on to carl so let me just move to here so here you see uh, we've created a, uh, a demo uh, for box bank and i could sign in um it would take a few moments to do that um, so i've already done that here um, and this is the front end of BoxBank that I've already signed into. Um, I can look at a digital vault. The bank has provided me with a digital vault so I can store my information here. I could share it with tax consultants, with the bank itself if I wanted to, but also whenever every month the bank puts in a new statement. Um, so here I can get my statements, download them, view them very easily, and that, and that sort of thing. But today, I want to apply for a loan. So I go ahead, put the information that it's already got in, and uh, today I want to apply for a credit card. And it will now ask me, it's searching in the background to see if I've made an application like this before and in a moment it will find that i haven't and so it will then ask me to take a photograph and here you can see i'm in a very swanky room with sweden behind me but let me take a photograph so here i am and it will now ask me um to um get some information around where did i store these i should have got this here we go PII documents. So I'm going to, oh, wrong way around. They're all in the wrong place. Here we go. There we go. So I'm going to upload. It's asking me for a passport. I'm going to upload two. I'm going to put in a fake one, which is our CEO. And I'm also going to put in uh, my one as well and upload those. Once it's accepted those, it's now going to look for, it wants a driving license. Please don't write my number down if you see it. Um, and next it asks for the utility bill as a proof of address. And it also asks for a payslip. Problems with demos are always your internet connection. Let's cancel that one and try again. In the background, this information is being put into a set of folders within box. So here we have, uh, you can start seeing this information is starting to being, being populated already. And um, so there's the passport and the driving license. 
and let's see if it's uploaded yet. Um, and when we get there, if there is a rejected image, I'm just going to skip over the fact that it's not uploaded. Uh, you will see when it's uh, you will see that there is a red box around this. So we have sent this information out to a machine learning algorithm and we've got back the fact that this does not look like the person who photograph uploaded um, so that it is showing within the metadata that there is a uh, there is no face face match and it is a poor confidence level of 13 percent see if that's happened yet and never a good sign um but i can go con continue with this process with the electric bill with the payslip uh, but already you can see that this process will will fail because it's found a fake passport if for uh, the other for the other driving license, I don't think it will have been processed yet. Yeah, it has been processed. And here you can see that it's a green, green uh, square and that we've got a good confidence and there is a face match. So as a, uh, as a bank employee, I can look at this information when um, we can integrate this with a, uh, with a customer uh, relationship management tools such as Salesforce so they can live in Salesforce or they can live in box and you can manage uh, the information in this way looking at box itself you, we have the concept of folders and files and you're able to look at a whole range of different types of information you can look at images um, office documents Google Sheets a whole range of different types of things but I just wanted, before I passed over to Carl, to show you something within the administration console. This is where uh, we manage within Box, we manage our security. Uh, we surface this functionality so that you can integrate with uh, single sign-on, security, um, mobile management tools so that you can manage whatever um, solutions you have within the organization. and for instance, we can run reports around activity. So I can run a report over the last two weeks, but I can do longer if I want to. In every action that's been taken in Box, I could export this to a CSV file and then run further analysis on that or through the API integrate with a business intelligence tool. Um, but running this, you can see that I'm seeing all the different information um, and I can dive into particular files if I want to. So lots of people being looking at, but you know, I can see who's been doing things on a particular file, for instance. And within the enter, so an admin will s sit a long time, a uh, fair amount of time within something like this. Um, and they can manage retention policies, um, classification on uh, documents that can then be applied to uh, a particular piece of content and that will change how the content is managed and we can also do things like legal holds on content. So on that point I think I'm going to pass over to Adam. Is it back to Adam? Okay it's back to Adam. It is back to me. <laughs> Thanks Henry. That's all right. Is it back to the deck? Back to the deck, indeed. Th thanks for that, Henry. That was uh, re really interesting, and uh, I hope everyone else uh, found that useful. Um, uh, just before we hand over to Carl, uh, I just wanted to briefly touch on a uh, a joint customer of ours, um, Virgin Trains. You may have uh, the eagle-eyed amongst you may have spotted their logo amongst Henry's uh, slide deck. Um, we've been working actually with Virgin Trains now for uh, around uh, eight years or so. Um, during which time we've implemented a number of, of digital solutions um, that have really delivered a, a truly end, a digital end user experience. Um, uh, you'll probably be familiar with Virgin's culture, very much puts uh, staff at the heart of everything that they do. Um, but a few years or so ago, they were finding that they were growing so quickly uh, that their IT setup was uh, holding them back and employees were becoming frustrated uh, as time was being lost on collaborating with external parties 
uh, users were having to access multiple systems for, to perform some of their, their everyday tasks. Pretty much the exact issues that I talked about a few moments or so ago. Um, so following a, a collaborative review uh, of some of their issues, um, we implemented a migration to Office 365. Uh, we rolled out Box, uh, as you already know, uh, to enable staff to work more collaboratively. Uh, and we also implemented Azure Active Directory for secure identity and uh, access management. Um, and the outcome from the project has been a huge success. Uh, user experience is, is so much better for, for everyone. Uh, in fact, we've got a really nice quote from their, uh, their IT team at Virgin Trains who have been quoted as saying that if they were to go back to uh, life before the implementation, it would be like going back to the dark ages. Um, and a real key part of the success of the project was our focus on embedding change across the business and working with Virgin to provide ongoing training and support, really so that all the users felt engaged and actually included on that journey. So they didn't feel like change was happening to them. They were all part of that process as well. Um, we at Sferica believe that our clear focus on the end user experience uh, and ensuring that our clients can uh, empower their staff to get the best value from technology uh, really sets us apart. Um, as you might expect, we've got um, case studies, video case studies and, and, and written PDF case studies. So we'll be sure to, um, to share those with you uh, following the webinar as well. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Carl now for his uh, introduction to uh, Synaptec. Uh, so Carl, over to you. Is there a quick change of slide deck? Yeah, we're just gonna, we're just gonna, oh, there's a poll. Oh, a quick poll. A quick, quick poll before the change of slide deck. Your business strategy. Okay, thanks very much. We're just going to quickly uh, swap over slide decks. And while we're doing that, I'm going to talk a little bit about Synaptec as a business. So we're the digital innovation division of Spherica. Um, and to cut a very, very long story short, um, we were born out of our frustrations with sort of old fashioned IT, as we would call it. So as Henry talked about earlier, the sort of monolithic approach um, that's still uh, got quite a strong foothold in a lot of businesses um, doesn't enable us to work in the ways that we need to be working to deliver an excellent customer experience. So I'm just introduced to what's happening. Anyway, we will, we will forward you on. So Synaptec, what are we all about? Uh, we're here, uh, this is our, our mission statement, to supercharge the world of work through the power of technology to be a force for good in the workplace. Uh, very, very high level, and we won't delve into it now, but to expand on what I said earlier, really, we're here to deliver the types of integrations and the types of automation, similar to that banking example you saw earlier, uh, to enable you as businesses uh, and as business leaders to deliver a customer experience and even an, an internal experience that is the type of thing you need to be implementing to sort of drive your business forward. So I'm not going to go over all this again. So we've already covered some of the reasons why uh, digital transformation falls short. Uh, I've experienced it myself within businesses. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that nobody wants to do a digital transformation uh, project with the view that it's going to going to fall short. Um, that being said, it is a massively complex beast and there are many, many pitfalls and many, many reasons why uh, you might fall short. And we will look to address some of those as part of this presentation. So for me, uh, with my technology head on a second, I think the two main issues affecting companies today are in the capability of modern integrations between platforms like Box and, and, and some of the other platforms we talked about earlier, and also the social gap in terms of your IT department and your business. Um, IT as a, as a department, you know, I've been an IT ops guy. I know what it's like trying to keep all the lights on and keep all the plates spinning. And I think it's fair to say the landscape of IT has changed massively in, in the last sort of five years. It is a completely different beast uh, to the old days of keeping servers and data centers alive and well you can only work on the LAN in the office etc it, it's almost become work anywhere all the time i need everything at my fingertips and i just need it to work and if your it team can't deliver that there's probably a bit of friction between your it team and the business and we see that all the time it's not necessarily it's fault 
it's just changes happened around them and they've, I wouldn't say they've been left in the dark, but they haven't included IT as part of that strategy. Um, that's one of the common pitfalls that we see. Uh, I've got an example here. So we're going to talk about a company. It's a fictional company. Uh, you're about to see a lot of platforms uh, and vendors on my screen. These are all purely examples, um, but I've tried to keep it as high level as possible to give you a flavor of the types of integrations and the type of things that are possible today. So please don't think, oh, well, I haven't got Box, so I can't do this, or I haven't got Salesforce, so I can't do this. Chances are, if you're using a web platform, or even if you're using an on-premise system, or even something really old, sort of green screen stuff, there is a way to integrate or automate between those systems. So we're gonna use a modern example for now, but let's dive in. So this is our business, and these are our business units. And we're gonna say this is a company of about a thousand employees, so it's not huge. And we've got our departments here. Uh, they've been through digital transformation, they've spent lots of money, uh, and they've brought some really best of breed bits of kit. So typically what we see is sort of big, uh, platforms in each of these departments. Um, so we've got Marketo in the marketing team, we've got Salesforce for sales, we've got Zendesk in the IT support space, we've got ServiceNow in the uh, IT operations, uh, we've got an Oracle uh, system for finance, and we've got Workday, I don't, not technically ERP, I'll correct my own presentation there, uh, doing our human capital management, so that's our people, our HR systems. Um, already here, before we even go any further, we're seeing a proliferation in platforms between the IT departments. So we've got ServiceNow doing operational things and we've got Zendesk doing support things. Uh, and those of you that know ServiceNow as a platform will probably start going, yeah, but you can do support things in ServiceNow. Yes, you can. However, for cost, this business has decided to put all their support uh, work into Zendesk. So already we've got two systems that could do the same thing that we're paying for twice. So, it's fair to say these platforms uh, as bits of bits of kit uh, are very good. However, they don't do everything. Um, so what happens when I've got a good I've got examples here, actually, if we press on, there we go. So Marketo doesn't do these things. Salesforce doesn't do these things. And the points I highlighted there aren't really important. It's just the main thing you need to take away that is every platform you choose won't do 100% of what you need to do. Um, so what's happened in our example here, our sales team are really forward thinking. They've got a guy uh, at the top of their sales team and he's really into all this stuff. So he's gone out and guess what? He's bought some more platforms uh, to sort of get around the, uh, the bits that Salesforce doesn't do for them. And that's fine uh, and that's great. Um, we've got a modern system, we've got, got all this working, we're really happy. But then what happens when we multiply this across the business? So our recruiting team have gone out and bought a platform. Our events team's bought a platform. The IT guys have been and bought something else. Okay, not necessarily the end of the world right now. But then this happens. I'm laboring the point with the flashlights here. But what happens is people just go and buy platforms. And those of you who have ever purchased a cloud platform know how easy it is. You armed with your credit card on expenses could purchase an entire cloud platform in about three seconds. And that's great because it means you haven't got to go for these lengthy deployment projects like days of old. But how many of these platforms in this business do IT even know about? How many were sponsored by IT? How many of them have crossover? How many of them have got data all over the place that we, we, we don't even know? Um, in this example, I've actually put Slack up there twice on purpose, uh, and I think Adam gave it a similar example earlier. So Slack in IT is an IT purchase. The company knows all about it. It's uh, got governance applied to it, so we can't do things we shouldn't do with Slack. Uh, we make sure that we remove people from the Slack system when they leave the business, et cetera, et cetera. But our ERP guys have also bought Slack and no one's got a clue about that. No one's got any idea that that even exists. Uh, I won't give the name of the business, but uh, Sferica did some work with somebody recently who used, uh, it wasn't Box, but a company very, a lot like Box, who had so many individual accounts, they actually ran the business and said, 
hi guys, you've got several thousand private accounts. Would you like a business plan? How, how nuts is that? <laughs> anyway, we'll move on. So that's 41 web platforms there for a thousand employees. And if I'm honest, I've probably been a bit, uh, I haven't probably encompassed all the platforms I possibly could. I've probably been quite lenient. In reality, there's probably even more. Um, you're probably sat there going, well, okay, so we might have platforms IT you don't know about, but that's not really a problem, is it, Carl? Because at the end of the day, we've got to get work done. I've been that guy that's been and bought a platform and circumvented IT because it's just easier. But it's not necessarily the right thing to do. So why is this bad? I've already touched on some of these points. It's 41 platforms to manage, assuming IT even knows about all of them. 41 sets of reporting. 41 platforms we need to try and access control. So when somebody leaves, you've got to try and find out which of those 41 platforms they were a member of, and that's 41 websites you've got to go to. None of these platforms talk to each other. Not a single one of them out of the box will just work with another. Huge potential for data overlap. I would argue you probably don't even know where your data is at that point. Shadow IT, yeah, massively. And 41 potential compliance nightmares. I would hate to be the compliance guy that's trying to make sense of this, but if I'm honest, I think this is going on in a large proportion of businesses across the world right now. And platforms for. It's also a terrible user experience because I've got to go and interact with all of these different platforms and I've got to open a browser page for each of them. So all I'm going to do is spend my day jumping between tabs in my browser and copy and pasting information, which is just crazy. Nobody leaves school and says, I want a job where I just copy and paste stuff between web pages, right? It's a waste of time and effort. And, and you're probably sat there thinking now going, yeah, I'll, I'll do that sometime. But why? <laughs> The good news is that's what Synaptec do. We're trying to address this. So what do we do? We're going to get rid of the departments. Uh, for those of you who are business leaders and, and IT leaders on, on the phone, stop thinking of these platforms as something that HR use or something that IT use. Start thinking of these as key cornerstones for your business, from company culture all the way down to what it actually delivers for you. Is it the right tool? And can you use it across multiple departments within your business? Don't be fully dictated by the department. For instance, sales, we're going to go with Salesforce. Obviously, that's a major, major part of their day-to-day -day work. But what else can it do for your business? Is there anything different we could do? Is there another module we could write to make that work? Uh, just some honest advice from me. <laughs> so we sit in the middle of all of this. And we treat these as key cornerstones of making work happen, making business happen. And we're going to look at some examples shortly of, of how we might be able to apply some technology to sort of solve this issue of, of disjointed and disparate systems. Um, you'll notice I've put Microsoft Teams and Slack on the right hand side. I've done that on purpose. And for those of you who aren't aware of these, although I think Microsoft's desperate for you to install Teams everywhere now, it sort of nags you on a daily basis, doesn't it? Uh, these are what we call collaboration hubs. And we think as a business, these are going to be really important going forward, and we'll, we'll demonstrate why we think that is uh, shortly. So, a quick break because I'm already sick of the sound of my own voice. Another poll for you Have you ever left the business and still had access to systems? Be honest because I know I have. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're going to review all the, the poll questions at the end of the, the webinar, folks, just in case you're interested. I'm interested to see what the answer is. Thank you very much. OK, so what I wanted to do for this webinar was actually show you some live use cases of, of this technology. But the problem is, because it's all software and API based, it's not a very exciting example because all you see is information pop up here and the process runs through in about two milliseconds and the output happens. So not the best example. So what I've actually done is drawn it out so we can talk through it slow time and we can understand how this all works. So we have a system, a system called Workday. Uh, it's not massive in the UK, I don't think, but it's huge in America. Uh, and this is where we manage all of our people. So when somebody joins the business, this is our source of truth. This is our HR system. And we put our person into that system to say, yep, we're taking on this person to do this role on this salary. We've got all their details, et cetera, et cetera. 
in this business and in this example, uh, we're going to use ServiceNow as our ITSM tool. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with, with ServiceNow, it's, it's quite a good system whereby uh, it started life as an IT tool and it's kind of grown legs and become all things to all men. Um, and what this example, uh, this company here, they're quite forward thinking. So they've actually done some integration between Workday and ServiceNow. So we know that when uh, an employee starts, we've got all their details in Workday already, and we're going to take all their details such as name, date of birth, what equipment they're having, et cetera, et cetera, and we're going to pass that to ServiceNow. And in a lot of examples, that's where the clever stuff would end. Um, it would go into ServiceNow, there'd be some service desk people and some, some technology people who'd come along, build laptops, set things up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's not how we operate and not how we want to work because we've got 41 systems to access control, remember. So how do we do it? Oh, sorry, I've forgotten. We could have two-way integration between Workday and ServiceNow, so the two could talk to each other, but that's not hugely important. So the first thing we do, uh, we have an API call from ServiceNow into one of these collaboration hubs, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a collaboration hub. It could be an email, it could be a text message, it could be whatever it is that you want to do as your business process. And we go and speak to their manager. So we say, hello, Mr. Manager. Uh, you're taking on Suzanne. Uh, she's coming to work in your marketing team. Is she starting on you know, Monday the 1st? Is her name spelled correctly? Is her salary correct? Are you happy, manager man, based on the information that we pulled out of Workday? And hopefully he says yes. That information then goes back into ServiceNow. And ServiceNow says, right, I've got a load of work I need to do now. And the first thing I'm going to do is create an identity for this user. So those of you are familiar with Active Directory or Okta, it could be Azure Active Directory, it could be on-premise. So we're going to create an account for Suzanne. And we know, based on the job that Suzanne's getting, because Workday's told us, she needs she needs access to these five systems. She needs Marketo, she needs Salesforce, and she needs whatever else she needs to do her day-to-day -day work. So great, we've created Suzanne an account. The next thing we do is kick off provisioning. So suddenly we know Suzanne needs access to all of those systems up there uh, to do her job because we've, we've got role-based uh, access to things. Uh, we've had a chat with Okta via ServiceNow and we've gone away and created Suzanne account or single sign-on accounts for each of these platforms. I should add the only human interaction at this point has been somebody giving Suzanne a job in the first place and the manager saying, yes, I'm happy with these details. Oh no, my arrow's not loading. And the last thing we do is communications. Um, I think automation, it's too easy to become robotic. It's too easy to just let automation do all the work for us. So I think it's really important to have that human touch. So based on your onboarding policy or however it is that your culture works within your business, you can do things like send Suzanne an email. Hi Suzanne, really looking forward to you starting on Monday the blah. You're gonna be meeting your manager who's so-and-so. Uh, on the first day, don't bother wearing a suit. We wear shorts and t-shirts in the office and we're gonna go for lunch. How great is that? Suzanne's really looking forward to starting. We've got all our access control ready. We've fixed any compliance problems. We've got access control sorted. Uh, and we could, you know, really flesh this out. So we could have a laptop building for her. We could have whatever it is we needed for Suzanne to do her job. I'm not going to insult your intelligence and say, well, obviously, this depends on your business, but you get the idea of how this, this all fits together. Okay, let's move on. Yes, and Synaptex sits in the middle of all of that. We are the bit that makes that talk to everything. Uh, we could even do the basic integration between Workday and ServiceNow. The benefit of that being that we enter the information in Workday first, and then we've got the information, we never have to enter it again. Uh, Adam alluded it to it earlier. One of my biggest bugbears is constantly giving businesses my information over and over again. It drives me crazy. <laughs> Had a very good example, actually. I booked a hotel uh, last night on Booking.com. Booking.com obviously knows all of my details. I use it on a weekly basis. The first thing I do is get to the hotel and they give me a piece of paper and say, please spill this in with your name, address, and phone number. It's half past 10. I've got a webinar to prepare tomorrow for tomorrow. And I'm just stood there going, but you should know this. Um, one of my particular bugbears, that is, but we'll move on. <laughs> So this is quite cool. So let's imagine we've implemented that process that I've just talked through. Uh, and that's how you've, you've gained your budget to go away and do your project around joiners, movers, leavers within your business. And you've automated that process. Um, and one of the great things about automation is by, by doing that, we can now reuse the same technology, the same methodology to deliver other business benefits. 
Um, so one of the things Henry talked about earlier was the ability for Box particularly to tell us when something looks unusual. So we're going to go through an unusual process. This is Sally. Sally's just resigned from the business. And the first thing she's done is gone back to her desk and started downloading the entire contents of her box uh, folder or access. It's about 25 gigs worth of data. Uh, and in the old world, in our monolithic approach, we probably have no idea this had even happened at this point. We'd be hoping that USB access control had kicked in and wasn't allowing it to copy it to a USB stick or whatever it was that, that Sally was up to. So Box pings us a message in, into our Synaptic system to say, this looks weird based on our workflow that we've put in place. The first thing it does, it raises a ticket. It raises an IT ticket in Zendesk in this example. The next thing it does, it goes and has a word with a manager. It says, hi Dave, one of your staff, Sally Jones, has downloaded 25 gig of data from Box. I've already raised a ticket. And if he was to click that ticket in that reference in Slack, it would actually take him into Zendesk to, to see the sort of raw data or the API information that we've got from Box. Uh, and it, it says, what do you want to do about it? So Dave, the manager, could say nothing I know about this. This is just Sally downloading cat videos. We think it's fine. Uh, and it would then get back into Zendesk and close the ticket down and we'd all get on with our days. But Sally shouldn't be doing this. She's actually downloading customer data at this point. We're really not happy about that. So Dave, in this example, is going to revoke, revoke all access to all systems within the business from Slack. Cool. So he presses the button. It updates the ticket in Zendesk, it has a chat with Okta, and before Sally's even uh, knows what's happening, she's lost all access uh, to her systems. Again, you could call security, do whatever you want to do, uh, but you can start to see how this is really powerful and imagine how quickly that could happen. Customer experience went very quickly because I'm being told I'm rabbiting too much. <laughs> So we talked about earlier, digital transformation is really key for us delivering a good customer experience within a business because we know customers are going to become more demanding as time goes on. So what we've got here is information coming in. So this could be uh, customer complaints. Um, we've got structured stuff. So we've got a complaints form on our website and then we've got unstructured stuff, which could be things like text messages, emails, um, tweets, stuff like that. In this example, we've got it all going into an Office 365 mailbox. We then use using an AI content classifier, which is a big scary word to say, we pump it into some AI to understand what it is that the person is, is talking about, what it is they want to do or they're unhappy about. If we understand what that is, we create a ticket service now. If we don't understand what that is, we back out to a human to say, what is this person on about? And we create the ticket and service now. And again, just to illustrate, we can then kick off automation from service now. It doesn't have to be service now, it could be anything to do some doing, essentially. So imagine if the AI has understood what the person wants, we've created the ticket and we've been able to automate the outcome. Even if we only do that for 10% of our tickets in a customer service environment, we have got more time for our people to, to spend doing what they do. And we, we can make customers happy yeah, because we can just deliver stuff faster. Cool, we'll move on. So what is AI? We'll go through this really, really fast because Suzanne's telling me to shush. Uh, AI in broad terms, two, two distinct categories in my mind at the moment. There's narrow, uh, which is AI for a specific purpose. So that example I just use is narrow AI. And general AI is essentially creating a computer that thinks and, and behaves the way that we do. Some examples of narrow AI at the moment is Google Vision, uh, Siri and Amazon Alexa, just so you guys can understand. It's narrow because it only does a distinct subset of things. If we ask Siri something in the wrong way, it won't understand what we want. If we had a general AI, which is a hell of a lot more complex, we could ask it in anything in any way, and in theory, it should understand what it is that we're, we're trying to get at. Machine learning, uh, just to dispel any myths, because I, I, I hear these two terms battered around a lot at the moment, I don't think anyone really understands them. Machine learning is essentially when we feed data into an AI, into a system to carry out a specific uh, purpose. A good example of this is understanding speech or captioning a photograph. Again, Henry's bank example earlier was using machine learning to, to see if that was really a picture of him or Aaron Levy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and a neural network, you might have heard this phrase quite a lot. So this is a, a computer network that's designed to behave in the way that the brain functions. And we use neural networks all the time to deliver this type of AI. Cool. Benefits of our approach, uh, the way Synaptic do things. 
with less platform sprawl, less risk to projects, repeatable process, we can achieve more with less, we can deploy rapidly, we can do fast automation, the ability for IT to say yes again, uh, it's easy to maintain and operate, saves cost, and we can create an IT architecture that's flexible and enables IT to be facilitators. Uh, and again, we can do some very, very cool things <laughs> with the types of AI and ML that we were just talking about. And the innovation potential is endless. Lovely. Shall I hand back to you now, Suzanne? Thank you. Or Henry or wherever it is. Yep. Perfect. Thank you, I think. Thanks, Carl. Um, I'm sure everyone's pretty mindful. There's an awful lot that we've covered off there between the, uh, the, the three presentations. Um, there's a few questions that have popped in. The, the follow-up to this, we will share the presentation and come back on uh, on uh, the information we've got from the polls as well. I'm just mindful that we're, we're pretty tight on time. So um, there's one question in particular on the security ramifications uh, with the multi-layered system. Um, I might... Uh, Ask you guys, uh, my clever technical chaps, if they just want to pick up one or two of the questions that have popped in, if that's okay. Sure, so my MacBook's not functioning whatsoever, so if you <laughs> want to let me know what the questions are, I'll happily answer them. Um, so the first question is, what are the security ramifications with this multi-layered system? Sure, so I think security's got to be at the heart of what we do as a business, because it would be uh, bad of us not to be. So everything we do, uh, we would use API security as a minimum uh, to secure those API endpoints to ensure that the connection between system A and system B is secure. Also things like two-factor authentication into platforms come into play. Um, yeah, I think that's at a very basic level what we do. Okay, and then we also have a, a similar security-esque uh, question. So, uh, going from the person's private PC to the box bank site to AWS for veri verification, etc., does it not provide more avenues for attack? <clears throat> so this is where an organisation like Synaptech, Synaptech would would come in, and they'd make sure that it that it meets the compliance um, security levels that that the organisation needs. Mm -hmm. I think Perfect. Is, yes, it does provide a broader attack vector for somebody to do something bad, but these systems are penetration tested regularly. Yeah. And to be honest, I think they're probably safer in the cloud than they would be within a traditional data center. Cool. Perfect. Okay. I think we've probably got about 30 seconds left. So uh, all I will do is thank you all very much for your time in attending today. Uh, thank you very much, Carl and Henry, for your presentations. As I say, I'll follow up with a copy of the webinar um, statistics from the polls as well. Um, and then for sure, if anyone's got any more questions or wants to uh, dive a little bit deeper into any of the topics we've covered today, uh, there are our contact details and they'll be on the email as well. So thank you all very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.